next on Unsolved Mysteries. When the investigation into the murder of a Texas woman comes to a standstill, a cold case detective brings on the heat. In Pennsylvania, churchgoers are certain that they've seen a miracle in the eyes of a carved wooden statue. A Washington, D.C. woman leaves the city to find peace and quiet in the country. Instead, she dies at the hands of a brutal killer. And Bonnie Potter searches for the mysterious woman who called her one day. Bonnie now knows that she is the sister she never knew. Our team is standing by, and maybe someone watching can help bring in one of these bad guys. And you know what? It could be you. I'm Dennis Farina. Join us. Virginia is less than 70 miles from Washington, D.C., but it's like a different world. The community consists of little more than a post office and a few homes. To Ethel Kidd and her husband Gilbert, it seemed like the perfect escape from the big city. They bought a piece of land and began building a retirement home. The move was a dream come true for Ethel. Her children and grandchildren lived in the area and much of her life centered around her family. She was a good person. She was liked by everybody. She liked to cook. She liked to have cookouts and picnics, and she just enjoyed life. One Wednesday, after visiting her daughter who lived nearby, Ethel was seen checking her mailbox around 2 p.m. Thursday, the next morning, my wife called her mother about 7.30, and the answering machine answered. And she said, that's funny, Mom must have left early. Either she's on the way here to have a cup of coffee. About 9.30, I rode by, and I saw the car there. Something hit me that something was wrong if she didn't answer the phone. I saw this book, and I saw that it was a an atlas, a map, and I just picked it up and carried it with me. I thought maybe Ethel may have dropped it. When I opened the door, that's when my heart came up in my throat. Ethel! I knew something was wrong. She would never leave the door unlocked. She always had the door locked, even during the day. Ethel, are you here? But there was no sign of Ethel and there was no sign of a burglary or foul play. Everything in the house was in its place. It was as if Ethel had been there one moment and then simply vanished the next. The police mobilized a large task force. Officers fanned out from Ethel's home and searched the woods and fields acre by acre. They found no sign of Ethel Kidd. Then, Eight days later, three miles from Ethel's home, a hunter came upon a shocking sight. It was Ethel's body, bound to a tree facing a logging road less than 50 feet away. Investigators determined that Ethel had been strangled. They also found evidence of sexual assault and estimated that she had been dead for about seven days. This area had been searched by land and air. She was definitely not at that location earlier in the week. The killer is extremely brazen to bring a body back to the area where it was kidnapped from and place it in a position so it would be found. Facing a road just off of a state road and just off of a logging road, uh, 
it's even as if he may have been taunting the police, uh, saying, catch me if you can. Police noted that the body showed no signs of decomposition. It seemed that Ethel had been kept in cold storage after she was killed. The medical examiner stated that, in his opinion, that she had been kept in an insect-free, climate-controlled condition, which could mean refrigeration, uh, either stationary or mobile. The authorities thought that the body could have been kept in a refrigerated truck or a walk-in freezer. Ethel had been tied up with a type of drapery cord used in hotels and hospitals. Car upholstery fibers were recovered from her clothes. But the investigation centered on items tucked inside the road atlas that was found in Ethel's front yard. These two sheets of paper from a national motel chain contain sexually suggestive messages. However, the most chilling discovery was a handwritten list of seven items. Police suspected that this was a meticulous blueprint for murder. Line two listed clothing and accessories which may have been used for a disguise. Line three read ID ASAP Paper Trip Book. Authorities were aware of a book called The Paper Trip, which described how a person could obtain a new identity. Item four simply read, choose location. Item five listed the abbreviations HC, TP, and SG. The best that we can come up with would be handcuffs, tape, and either surgical gloves or stun gun. This individual is a methodical, cunning individual. He is a loner. He is a white male, probably between 35 and 45 years old. He has not had successful relationships with females. We have to assume that this individual does traveling and stays in motels, which could be consistent with an interstate trucker or a salesperson. Ethel was extremely security conscious. Authorities believe that the assailant may have used the road atlas to trick her into thinking that he needed directions. Uh, excuse me. I'm lost. Can you show me where Culpepper is? This was a very cunning, devious, calculated murder. Because of leaving clues, bringing the body back, just the way that he did everything in this case and hasn't been caught, yes, it's my opinion that he will kill again. Hopefully, if he gets put away for doing this, that it won't be done to anybody else. Because nobody deserves to be done like this. Nobody deserves to die like this. Update. Investigators always believe that their best clue was the road atlas found in Ethel's yard. Forensic technicians lifted fingerprints from several pieces of paper that were tucked into the atlas. But without a known suspect, the prints are useless. But after watching our broadcast, one person thought that the handwriting looked very familiar. The tipster provided a name, Edward Wayne Beverly. He had lived in Burr Hill, Virginia, just a few miles from Ethel Kidd. Shortly after her murder, he had suddenly left town. Virginia authorities located Beverly in a Tennessee prison where he was serving time for armed robbery. We compared fingerprints and they matched Mr. Beverly's prints. And on the victim's body, there was evidence there indicating uh, uh, sexual contact. And we compared Mr. Beverly's blood through DNA testing and that matches up also. I'm convinced that we have the right guy that did this crime based on the evidence that's available. Beverly was identified just months before his scheduled release. He was tried for the rape and murder of Ethel Kidd, found guilty and given three life sentences. Edward Wayne Beverly died in prison.
When we come back, mysterious phone calls may be clues to the fate of a young woman who has been missing for 25 years. In the days before abortion was legal, some pregnant women turned to bogus doctors to perform the procedure. Many women died. At least one young woman went in for the operation and simply disappeared. In Coral Gables, Florida, a 22-year-old medical technician named Judith Himes learned that she was pregnant. Yes, I'm here for a pregnancy test. All right, if you'll just sign your name and address here. The name she gave for her pregnancy test was a false one, B. Kenny, an indication that she may have been trying to keep her condition a secret. Judy never said anything to me that she might have been pregnant. She never even told me that she went to have a test, a pregnancy test. Um, she called me, I guess the day that she was going to have the abortion, if that is what happened, uh, to tell me that she was going shopping. She was leaving work early and going shopping. That day, Judith went to her bank and withdrew $300. She told her friends that she was going to buy a watch. Police believe that Judith used the money for an illegal abortion. Uh, we were able to determine that she contacted a close friend of hers who uh, helped arrange an abortion through the suspect, uh, Dr. George Hodgett. And uh, through that, a date and time and a price were set for it. Judith made the arrangements to get the uh, money the last time she was seen, we feel that she was on her way to get this abortion. Get plenty of rest. You'll be fine in no time, huh? George Haju was a Hungarian immigrant who posed as a doctor. Police say that he operated an illegal abortion clinic in Coral Gables. Judy? Having an abortion, I don't think she really had any other choice because Nobody in those days would have a child and keep it. It just wasn't done. Judy? Judy. Judy. Right through here, huh? A lot of people have said that what happened to her was that she died having an abortion. Judy was a lab technician. She had a lot of medical knowledge. I find it hard to believe that she could have died having an abortion. Uh, I, I mean, surely she would have known she was intelligent enough to know to go for help someplace. Wherever she had gone that day, Judith Himes never came home. Three weeks later, a rental car registered in Judith's name was found 650 miles away in Atlanta, Georgia. On the back seat were traces of blood. Unfortunately, the car had sat there for two or three days before it was found. And then by the time we were able to conduct any crime scene on it, the car had been handled by other people, other police agencies. And by the time it got back to Dade County to be processed, whatever crime scene existed was totally ruined. A local resident had seen a man in his 30s parking the vehicle. He removed what appeared to be a duffel bag from the trunk and then left the area. This man has never been identified. Three months later, George Haju was arrested for impersonating a doctor. George Haju? Yes. Coral Gables police, sir, you're under arrest. Police suspected Haju might know about Judith Himes' disappearance. However, Haju jumped on and was never seen again. Shortly after he fled, the investigation into Judith's disappearance ground to a halt. A quarter of a century passed, and then a bizarre series of events caused the case to be reopened. It began with a routine law enforcement seminar. Captain Chuck Shearer of the Coral Gables Police Department lectured at a police academy near Omaha, Nebraska. When Shearer returned to Florida, he received a mysterious phone call. Hello? Hello, is this Captain Shearer? Yes, it is. What can I do for you? The caller claimed to be the host of a radio program in Omaha. He said that he had received a phone call about the disappearance of Judith Himes. But when Captain Shearer called the station the following day, 
The radio host said that he had never heard of Judith Himes, nor had he called Captain Shear. Well, now I'm confused. I don't know what to think. Why would a 25-year-old case surface all of a sudden out of Omaha, Nebraska, when in fact I've never been to Omaha, Nebraska in my life prior to this time uh, and had no knowledge or anything about the case? I never mentioned the case whatsoever the whole time we were out there for the simple reason I really didn't even know about the case uh, to, to give anybody any information or anything. Good evening, Carl Gables Police Department. Captain Shear, one moment. Two days later, Shearer received another strange phone call. Hello, Captain Shearer. Judy Himes is alive, and she lives in Omaha. Who is this, please? Judy Himes is alive, and she lives in Omaha. Who is this? Hello, who is this? My gut feeling is that something is going on to bring this case back up 25 years later, and it very possibly is that Judy is, in fact, living in, in the Omaha area. Then a story on the Himes case appeared in a local newspaper, and Captain Shearer received a third mysterious phone call. This one mentioning the fraudulent doctor, George Hachu. Hello, Captain Shearer. The third phone call that I received was from a man that identified himself as an informant for the FBI. Yeah, would you give me your name, please? He refused to give me his name, but he said that he had just spent several weeks with Haju over in Budapest, Hungary, and he gave me the phone number. I contacted Interpol, and Interpol determined that the phone number that he gave me indeed comes back to the same name of the suspect at that time, the doctor that supposedly performed the abortion. Police couldn't locate George Haju in Hungary, but they felt that it was highly unlikely that he was responsible for the phone calls. Judy Himes is alive, and she lives in Omaha. The only real evidence that Judith was alive came from the mysterious phone calls. If they were telling the truth, then where's Judith Himes today? Could Judith herself have made the calls? Or if Judith had died during a botched abortion, who was making the calls and why? The only possible scenario that I could see is that she didn't want the family to know about the, the supposed abortion at the time, and she just disappeared and, in fact, has been missing for 25 years, not wanting her family to know about it. I'd like to believe that she's someplace and that she could be found or that she'd come back or that we'd know that she's all right. Um, I, I guess my personal theory is, is it's hard to believe that she, that she would be dead. But I can't understand if she's alive, why she wouldn't contact somebody after all this time. After all, there's no more stigmas left. Why wouldn't she come back? Update. Four days after our broadcast, an unsigned letter arrived at the Coral Gables Police Department. The typewritten note said that Judith Himes died from complications during an illegal abortion and that her body was dumped in Biscayne Bay near Miami. Police feel that the letter is legitimate and have no explanation for the mysterious phone calls from Nebraska. We would like the author of the letter to come forward and to contact us at the Carl Gables Police Department. We are not interested in any prosecution because Basically, the statute of limitations has expired on this case, and it would be no criminal prosecution. Also, we would guarantee total confidentiality to the writer of the letter. If you can help authorities with this case, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. Coming up, parishioners in Pennsylvania believe that they see a miracle in the eyes of a crucifix. Ambridge, Pennsylvania. Abandoned steel mills line the banks of the Ohio River, a grim reminder of the region's lost prosperity. But many residents of Ambridge refuse to move out of town. Some of these people gather at the Holy Trinity Church to gain strength from their Catholic faith and from each other. The congregation is proud of the beautiful crucifix, which has been at the church since 1931. 
It was refurbished by a local artist, Dominic Leo. I became really deeply involved for two weeks with the crucifix. It had been here at this church for possibly over 60 years. So now it was time to restore it. And when I completed everything and finally got to the face, I actually worked on all of the face and the eyes last of all. And when I got to the eyes, then I just painted them and put the color of the blue-gray into the retina. And then I started to put some accents into the sockets of the eye to show the, the, the uh, the, the color of death. After Dominic finished his work on the crucifix, the church held a special three-hour mass to celebrate Good Friday. Jim Suvitkovic was the nephew of the parish priest, and that night, he was serving as an altar boy. Everything was normal. You know, we had our readings and sang the songs and veneration of the cross. I got communion, and I went down on the side of the altar, um, just waiting for everyone else to get done. That's when my brother Tom came up next to me, and I was looking up and I was praying. As Jim looked upward into the face of Christ, he had a stunning surprise. The eyes that were once open now appeared to be closed. I was shocked. I didn't know what to believe at first. I was happy. But I was scared at the same time because, you know, you figure that God, you know, he did this right there while I was kneeling right there. And I turned to tell my brother Tom. Just look. And he looked up and verified what I saw. His eyes are closed. Go to the other side and check. Maybe the but then we thought maybe it was just the lights or something. Just to make sure that, you know, we just weren't seeing things. I had to go to the other side. I looked up and noticed that the eyes were still closed. It didn't hit me until we went into the back, and I had time to think about it for a few minutes. And that's when I, I started crying, because, you know, you don't expect something like that to happen. And, you know, it was something that I was a part of. They were crying. And I asked them what happened, and they said, the eyes on the cross are closed. So I went back out with another priest who was helping me that evening, and we looked and there was a change. And I started to look around in church at the people going out the doors. And on the back was the artist who had refurbished a cross. And I called out his name two or three times and asked him to come to the altar area. And I just simply said to him, would you look at the cross and tell me what you see? First, when he told me that, I was wondering what could possibly be wrong. You know, I says, is it falling down? And the second thing I says, it don't look like it's falling down. I says, is it a defect? Some of the plaster's falling down or something, you know? And it wasn't that. And my eyes just went straight up to the crucifix. And we couldn't believe what I saw because not only were the eyes closed, but there was like all kinds of tears underneath it. And they were fleshy, like, you know, there were the, uh, the eyelids were, were moving and moving like this. And, and all the tears were in there. And, it was just like as if crucifixion had just started again from 2,000 years. It looked just like that. They were all on their knees and everything. It was just, I could never forget that. Never. Never. Dominic, go ahead. You go up first. You know the crucifix better than anybody. The crucifix was suspended 22 feet in the air, so a ladder was brought in to allow for a closer look. Dominic was the first to make the climb. I went up to the tip top of the A ladder. I straddled the ladder at the top of it, and I had a very close look at the eyes. The, uh, the left eye is closed, and the right eye is slightly, slightly open. It was just unbelievable what I saw. This eye here, this eye here was closed completely, except for a, a little sliver of gray. But this eye here was open slightly, and you could just see the bottom the bottom of the retina. And this is what really did it, because when I seen that, I, it looked like it was burned, that it had been burned from energy of some sort. Another parishioner who had to see for himself was Pennsylvania State Trooper Chris Marion. I wanted to make sure nobody had tampered with it. And I got real close, like a three-year-old would look into its father's face. And as I looked at it, I realized there's no way it was too high 
I knew no one could have tampered with it, and it was fine, and I felt good about it. I've been trained to look at things a little differently than norm the normal eye, just like I knew the crucifix a lot better than everybody. This wasn't some hoax. This wasn't a bunch of people just making this up. And everything that happened here was for a reason and was definitely the most religious experience that I've ever heard of in my lifetime. Sue Tulfa was another member of the church familiar with the cross. The cross used to be in an alcove area where anyone could come and light the big candles. And I've done that lots of times, and anybody that has ever lit a candle, when you look up, Jesus is looking at you. I remember the eyes were opened very clearly, the eyeballs, the white, the bluish gray. He was a live Christ dying on the cross, and his eyes were still opened. And that, on Good Friday, they closed. Before church officials will pronounce a miracle authentic, they will thoroughly investigate every aspect of the event. In this case, the Bishop of Pittsburgh was in charge of reviewing the mysterious crucifix in Holy Trinity Church. There is always value when people return to their faith, but you would want them to return for the right reasons, for what if they found out later that there was some deception here or some defraud that could be very harmful to their faith? And that's what the church is always concerned about in an, invest in an investigation like this, that we are very objective, we are very careful because of the harm that can come to faith. Since that Good Friday, Ambridge has been visited by thousands of people who wanted to see the crucifix for themselves. But what really happened in the Holy Trinity Church? Was it a miracle or hallucination? At times I sit here, I wonder if, you know, is this of God? Is this of something evil? But I know that people who are coming here are praying. They come from all over the place, and when they leave, they have peace. So there's, to me, this is all positive. The Bishop's Commission reviewed videotape and photographs showing the crucifix before and after the alleged miracle of Good Friday. Its conclusion, there was no convincing evidence that a miracle properly defined occurred at Holy Trinity Church. This decision meant that the Vatican will take no further action on the case. But to many people in Ambridge, Pennsylvania, this will always be one miracle that cannot be dismissed. I think my little nephew summed it up best for me. He said to me, Uncle Chris, I know what happened. He's five years old. And I said, what happened? He said, well, God closed his eyes so everybody else would open theirs. Next, a remarkable detective with more than 400 cold cases solved. Maybe you can help her find the killer who has stayed just out of her reach. Houston, Texas, 8 a.m. 64-year-old Opal Zacharias leaves her home for work. She has no idea that two men are lying in wait in her garage. Who are you? Take it easy, lady. What do you want? We just want your purse. Be cool. No. Yes. Hey, yes. Yes. Give us a purse. Yes. No. Yes. Give us a purse. Their plan may have been to simply rob her, but there was a struggle. Get back. Opal Zacharias died at the scene, and authorities could not identify either suspect. The killing remained unsolved for over a decade, and then it was assigned to one of the most successful cold case investigators in America. Her name is Robin Talton. Over the years, she's repeatedly proven herself with amazing results. Detective Talton found her career by accident. Literally, she and her partner were closing in on a wanted felon at a Texas machine shop. We were told he had escaped three different times, so he was a known rabbit. 
and we figured that he would run from us. The manager there was very cooperative. He, he actually agreed to point the guy out. Detective Talton, Harris County, you're under arrest. Let him go, I got him. <laughs> the detective that was with me kept after the defendant and he did get him. And I did not want this crook to know that I was hurt. And we walked it down to where the unit was. Are you okay? Yeah, man, I'm hurt. I'm hurt bad. Can you make it back to the car? Yeah. Detective Talton chipped her left kneecap and fractured the lower leg in two places. This arrest would change her life. Okay. Yeah, all right. While Talton recovered from her broken leg, she was assigned to the newly created cold warrant unit. What we'd like to do is get you to working on the computer and see if you can find some new sources of information where we can find these guys. And the unit was set up to trace and apprehend Harris County's most wanted felons. Many of these criminals had been on the lam for more than a decade. Okay. Hey, I'm in. Okay. I'm in. OK, can we start tomorrow? We can do that. OK. After 10 years working the street, Detective Talton found herself armed with faded warrants and outdated information. But she proved to have a talent for tracking down fugitives. The co-warrant unit is a little bit deceptive. It's not a, a band of, of detectives. It's one detective, Robin Talton. And uh, after she does her research, we have about an 80% rate of arrest. By the time I get the warrant, it's old enough that I feel like these guys have settled down and they think they're safe. Sometimes I start with just a name, an age range, and an old address. And I put together past acquaintances, family members, trying to find somebody that could fit. It's like putting the pieces together to see if it's gonna make sense. Yeah, sure am. It's yeah, kind of like a game of catch me if you can. Usually, she can. Detective Talton's work has led to the arrest of more than 400 fugitives. But despite her legendary success, Talton is troubled by the cases that she has not yet cracked. Cases like the ruthless killing of Opal Zacharias. From what I remember, the gunshot wound apparently entered the thigh and it came out the back of the hip. So the, the shot itself was not a fatal shot. But they had her purse and car keys and ended up stealing the, the car and backing over, and that's actually what killed her. A witness reported seeing one of the suspects flee the scene by climbing over a fence. Later that day, authorities found Opal's abandoned car. However, it yielded no clues that would lead to the killers. A year later, a police informant identified the trigger man as Lance Bedgood. He was still at large when Robin Talton got the case. While trying to locate Lance Bedgood, I came across some post office boxes, three in fact, that are still being looked at today. What we're assuming is that he's using three different post offices, basically as a mail drop, so he can keep in contact. Detective Talton discovered the mailboxes were registered to three of Bedgood's relatives and paid for by a fourth. But that's as close as she could get. Bedgood remains a fugitive. Lance Bedgood is five feet, eight inches tall. He has tattoos on his arms and legs and a scar over his left eye. He is wanted for the murder of Opal Zacharias. Bedgood should be considered armed and dangerous. Well, I'm glad that the investigation hasn't been forgotten. The sad part is my aunt's life was taken and she didn't get to see the, the family grow up and mature. And that's sad. If you have any information about this case, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. Coming up, 
A mysterious phone call leads two women on a search for a secret half-sister. Newcomb, New York, was the home of Oscar Norton for most of his 72 years. He was a well-respected member of the community, and with his wife, he raised a large family. No one suspected that for more than 40 years, Oscar had kept a stunning secret. His daughter, Bonnie, first learned about it eight years after he died. Hello? Yes, may I please speak to Oscar Norton? Oh my goodness, my father's been deceased for eight years. May I ask why you're calling? Why, I was informed that he's my father. I was taken back by the phone call because this is something you never expect in your life. And she proceeded with her conversation asking uh, if she could ask a few questions. And I said, well, sure. Was his mother named Eleanor? No, her name was Nellie. Oh. As the conversation kept going on, it didn't connect that this was anything feasible. And I said, well, may I ask you a question? Yes. Would I be speaking to a black woman or someone from the South? Well, yes, you are. Do you know you're speaking to a white woman? Well, yes, I do. And I'm thinking then there's been a mistake here. And uh, I said, gee, it's such a beautiful Sunday. It's too bad that um, I couldn't have found a half-black sister. And then the conversation, you know, um, ended. Goodbye. Bonnie just assumed that it was a case of mistaken identity but she could not get the call out of her mind. She immediately phoned her Connie, twin sister, Connie. Phone call I just got. What? This woman called and said I asked Bonnie, did you get her name or phone number or what part of the country she was from? And she said, no, she hadn't. And then when she said she was uh, of mixed race, I thought, no, that really can't be possible because uh, where would dad have ever met a woman of mixed race because we live in the northern part of New York State and it's primarily Caucasian and my father was always very busy raising a family and where could he have been to meet this woman? Before he was married, Oscar had enlisted in the army. One of his favorite war stories was about a motorcycle crash he had in the summer of 1942 while training at Fort Hood in Colleen, Texas. But there was a part of the story that he kept secret. Hey, you hear the good news? What's that? You're getting up tomorrow. Oh, I guess that is good news. You don't have to eat this army hospital food anymore. OK, come here. What's, what's that? I'm going to miss you. What? Why don't you let me give you a call? Oh, I don't think that's such a good idea. Oh, come on. Please. I'll think about it. Oscar and his former nurse were soon dating. You look so beautiful. But interracial relationships were not tolerated by local residents at the time. Excuse me, sir. I'm the manager, and I'm terribly sorry, but this table is reserved for some other folks. Well, I had a reservation. Your name, sir? Oscar Norton. Well, we have no reservation in that name, and I'm afraid it's going to be some time before we have another table available. Might I suggest uh, you all be more comfortable in an establishment across town? We aren't going anywhere. Oscar, it's OK. We can go to another restaurant, OK? Your hat, sir. I'll take care, OK? We will. Go. Oscar and his girlfriend eventually had a baby. They lived together off base for more than a year. But in the fall of 1943, Oscar was transferred overseas. He never saw either of them again. Dad wanted the information to be given out to all of us. Ironically, the one family member that my father conveyed this story to was to a family member that is, is having a difficult time dealing with his own um, prejudice. He didn't tell the rest of the family after my father passed away. And then when we got the phone call from the lady, 
he felt apparently some twinge of conscience that he should come forward and tell us. Was his mother's name Eleanor? No, her name was Nellie. Oh my goodness. When Connie thought back to the conversation, she realized that the woman referred to as Eleanor could have been her grandmother, Nellie. And I said, well, Bonnie, Nellie and Ellie are nicknames for Eleanor. And Bonnie goes, oh my God. She goes, maybe we had the right woman. I've talked about it several times since the phone call with family members, and we're just hoping that she's not ill. We're actually hoping her mother's alive. We'd, we'd like to meet her mother. Why don't you let me give you a call? Oh, I don't think that's This was a woman he had feelings for, and that was too bad if someone else couldn't deal with it. You look so beautiful. Well, thank you, Oscar. It was an ongoing relationship. It wasn't an army weekend out with the boys relationship. He stuck with her. He stayed with her. He had a child that he didn't deny with her. Granted, the denial has been for many years to our family because he was protecting his children from prejudice that society instills on all of us. There's times when people still find that kind of uh, prejudice now, but hopefully our family's gotten beyond that. The majority of our family, at least, has gotten, have gotten beyond that. She's going to be received with open arms and a whole lot of love. Bonnie Potter and Connie Fontaine are still looking for their half-sister. They want her to know that they care about her and hope that she contacts them again. Their sister was born in 1943 in Colleen, Texas. Her mother worked at a hospital near Fort Hood when she met Oscar Norton. Oh, I don't think that's such a good idea. Oh, come on. Unfortunately, all military records from that time were destroyed in a fire. If you have any information about this case, please log on to our website at unsolved.com.